The 20th century was a time of incredible change, unspeakable horrors, and amazing leaps of scientific discovery. It was a century marked by events that united and divided us, from great feats to great wars, with advancements and setbacks that showed us the power of many, the power of one. A century of revolutions, evolutions, and retributions. A century made by conflicts and crimes, inventions and entertainment, politics, protests, discoveries, and disasters. We will count down the 101 events of the 20th century. Their stories form the tapestry of our history and shape the world in which we live. In this episode... When the computer arrived, video games arrived with them. What the US wanted to do was basically to know what's China up to, how are we going to manoeuvre in terms of the new situation that's developing. Really, there was no chance for them to escape, and yet we got them away. We, we literally snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. The 20th century was a time of technological innovation. But as the new millennium drew closer, fear that an innocent bug could unravel all electronic systems and communications gripped the world. From machines that took up an entire room to handheld devices, the 20th century had seen the creation of computers. And as technology advanced, they became smaller and more sophisticated. But just as the world was preparing to ring in the new century, wonder at this new technology turned to panic. Back in the 1960s when memory space was very much an issue, you know, one megabyte of data cost millions of dollars, programmers had essentially set the date in computer programs to a two-digit number, so 71 instead of 1971. And the bug became an issue when people realized that coming up to the year 2000, this might create problems. By 1999, Computers have reached a saturation point where they controlled many aspects of everyday life. It may have been disastrous if computers got so confused by the date, in particular which century it was, that they shut down completely. The fear was that computers that were controlling critical infrastructure like power plants, uh, military installations, banks and financial institutions, dams, etc., the power grid, potentially could all be affected by this problem, which was not only a software problem, but also a hardware problem embedded into chips. The media took advantage of the hysteria spreading across the globe. I'm seeing a rather dark forecast. You're gonna lose half the population of the planet. Some countries prepared themselves, reprogramming both software and hardware to be Y2K compliant working together with everyone to create a community plan on how you would deal with the possibility that there may be some disruptions of the services we all take for granted. But this is a fixable problem. Uh, this isn't a natural disaster. When midnight of the inevitable date came, the result was one of history's most tremendous anticlimaxes. Obviously, there was a lot of hype around this. Um, some of the hype was justified, but in terms of actually fixing the actual bug itself, that was a serious issue. And I think the money that was spent and the programs that were put into place uh, years in advance to try to fix this problem resulted in the fact that we only saw very limited problems. The new year came and there were a few anomalies, including an equipment fail in a Japanese nuclear plant, which was quickly supplied with backup power before any damage was done. I think the major lesson from the Y2K problem was just to what extent modern society relies on an extremely complex overlayering of technical, sophisticated computer networks, and it's important to build resilience into these critical infrastructure programs. And 
financial institutions, et cetera, that rely on this electronic infrastructure. And in fact, we all rely on that for our day-to-day -day existence. More than anything else, Y2K highlighted that a lack of knowledge created a tendency to panic. The real lesson of Y2K was that the system most susceptible to failure is common sense. In 1953, Britain gathered together to celebrate a new epoch. Millions gathered in London or in front of their television sets at home to see a beloved princess who some years earlier had not been expected to become a queen. The final scene, the royal family assembled together on the palace balcony to receive the acclamation of their subjects. Born on the 21st of April, 1926, Princess Elizabeth Alexandra Mary was third in line to the throne when her uncle, Edward VIII, shocked the world by abdicating in December 1936, her father was thrust into the limelight as King George VI. By the 1950s, his health was in decline. While on a state visit to Kenya with her husband, Prince Philip, in February 1952, the 25-year-old Princess Elizabeth was told her father had died. The passing of King George VI came as a sudden and most grievous shock to his people all over the world and to all friends of the British Empire and Commonwealth. Despite national mourning for the death of a beloved monarch, the era also marked the end of drab post-war life. A new young queen offered the chance for celebration. God save the queen. What had marked the coronation in 1937 had been restraint and austerity. But you needed, in 53, to have something that was spectacular and upbeat, but not extravagant. The country's officials threw themselves into planning an event to remember. Preparations for the coronation take over a year. They started in May 52, so it's not something that's lightly undertaken. A thousand years of history and tradition unroll in London town on Coronation Day. On the morning of the 2nd of June, 1953, undeterred by heavy rain, millions lined the streets from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Abbey for a glimpse of the young queen in her golden coach. The coronation was the world's first major event to be broadcast live on television. We have anecdotes of one television in a street, huge parties being organized as houses, front rooms were crammed with people looking at the tiny flickering screens. The first necessary step in the traditional ritual is that the Queen should be accepted by the people. An estimated 27 million people in Britain watched the BBC's coverage on TV, with 11 million listening on radio. In the following weeks, it was seen across the globe Canisters of film being rushed to aeroplanes and flown to the USA and far corners of the Commonwealth just hours later. A surge of emotion built up over the long hours overflows now as the triumphant procession heads back to Buckingham Palace. Very few countries don't want their heads of state to be able to put on a degree of pomp and ceremony. And we like the heads of state that seem to manage it best while retaining it kind of accessibility. It's a very difficult balancing act. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. Early in the 20th century, it was widely believed that the pyramids of Egypt had long given up all their secrets. But one archaeological wonder was yet to be discovered. The Egyptian government, pressing on with its search for the tombs of the pharaohs buried near the ancient city of Thebes, continued to make new discoveries. In 1922, Archaeologist Howard Carter had been exploring Egypt for more than 30 years. Although everything of consequence was thought to have already been discovered in the Valley of the Kings, 
Carter was sure that somewhere a tomb lay undisturbed. The idea was that he was doing a complete survey of the valley, mapping where the people had worked and trying to spot areas where they hadn't worked. And he actually came very close to the tomb's entrance several years before he found it, but just stopped short and then went to another area. Towards the end of the 19th century, a tomb had been discovered containing some of the royal mummies. And this was the motivation to continue the search for others. And there they actually found the bodies of most of the kings of the period. So they could begin to work out who had not been found, who hadn't been robbed and moved out of their tombs. And so this prompted him. Digging in the dark, Carter's team found stairs that led down to a door of what appeared to be an unmarked tomb. And then when they cleared the rubble, they found a sealed door. And of course, that's when they really got excited and looked in. And what you actually have in the tomb is, I mean, it's literally was packed from floor to ceiling. It had been broken into a couple of times, but those robberies hadn't really, they'd done some damage, but not major. Three weeks later, they uncovered the tomb of the boy king, Tutankhamun. The Pharaoh's cause of death was discovered to be a broken leg, which had become gangrenous. News quickly spread of the discovery. There was a lot of interest, and there had been for you know well over half a century and more, in Egypt. And so as soon as something like this was found, it really made the headlines. And here's the boy king's golden sarcophagus, lined with plates of solid gold, carved inside and out. Extensive study of the artifacts, X-rays, and DNA testing continued for decades after King Tutankhamun's tomb was found. This research has revealed a lot about the 12th pharaoh, and consequently, a lot about the ancient Egyptians. Tut may have had a short and long forgotten reign, but since his rediscovery, has become one of the most famous pharaohs of Egypt. It's ironic to think that Tutankhamun should be more widely known today than 3,000 years ago when he ruled in the land of the pharaohs. There is this incredible discovery that's never been equaled in Egypt for this type of material, and it's still claimed that it has to be one of the most spectacular ever made. After lying hidden for 3,000 years, Tutankhamun has been on display and seen by thousands of people every day. His tomb remains an example of the world's fascination for ancient cultures. Out of the ashes of the Second World War, a new fear emerged in America, communism. With the onset of the Cold War, the federal government began to see the Red Terror in everything, from politics to Hollywood movies. It has been said that some of you are communists. The United States government feared that the rise in support for communism would mean America becoming enslaved by the Soviet Union two countries with fundamentally different ways of life. There's another concern that was sort of ambient at the time, and that's the sort of concern about state capture. Were there people in positions of power within the United States who might um, hand over or, or, or weaken the United States in such a way that the, the Soviet Union could take serious advantage of that? In response to the perceived threat, the House of Un-American Activities Committee set to work putting all perceived Reds on trial. The Communist Party of the United States is a fifth column if there ever was one. Formed in 1945, the committee was created to investigate any citizens or organizations of subversive activity and suspected communist allegiances. In early trials, they focused on their own government. The communists are red fascists. Later, the committee targeted the film industry in the prominent trials of 1947. The new set of trials would be invasive, examining people's personal lives and questioning their loyalty to the country. Members of the film industry were particularly targeted for their ability to influence public opinion. California throughout the 1930s has been a kind of a site of social and political unrest. People were concerned about the film industry. Would they be able to persuade ordinary Americans, for example, that capitalism was bad and that socialism was, was good? And so those were genuine concerns. While many were subpoenaed, it was the Hollywood Ten, a group made up of actors, writers, and directors, 
that became infamous for refusing to cooperate, stating their right of free speech. Don't believe you have the right to ask well, the question of anybody. It's, it's very apparent, it's very apparent that you're following the same line of these other witnesses. I am following is, no line. Which is definitely the communist line. I am using my so own head, which I shall you're, continue you're to do. You're excused. And if you want to make a speech, go out here under one of the big trees and Thank you. sound off. <laughs> Their patriotism cost them. They all faced prison time and fines of up to $1,000. They were also put on the blacklist. The careers of many film artists, writers and performers were tainted by such connections. The film industry is also an industry in which contracts are short. You're very vulnerable to things like rumor, gossip, to information that you can't control about yourself and your, and your loyalties. And so if you were behind the curve in moving from wartime sympathy with the Soviet Union to a Cold War hostility, then it was very easy to get associated with the wrong sort of political opinion and to have your career killed as a result. It wasn't until 1960 that the blacklist began truly losing its power. Spartacus was one of the first productions to name a previously blacklisted member of the Hollywood Ten, screenwriter Dalton Trumbo in the credits. The same year, Exodus also listed Trumbo, and an era came to an end. The committee eventually disbanded in 1975, signalling an end to the decades of national fear and paranoia. In the 70s, technology had opened up new ways for people to play games on screens. Teenagers filled arcades, feeding coins into their favorite machine. One game, amongst all others, would prove so popular that its name lives on to the present day. In 1978, the video games industry was struggling to find the right balance between complicated and simple designs. The difficult games were unpopular, the easy layouts quickly imitated by competitors. One of the earliest examples of a popular simple format was the table tennis arcade game Pong, released in 1972. In the home, the chip transformed an ordinary TV set into a magic box of video games. At that point, Pong had been the major um, sort of game changer for the industry. It had kickstarted this interest in, in video games and more broadly this fascination with playing with the screen. Pong was easy to copy, so the market was flooded with clones, forcing prices down. There was a real danger that video games would push themselves into oblivion. However, a new game saved the day. Game designer Tomohiro Nishikado channeled a combination of influences into his new project, Space Invaders. It was an instant sensation, replacing popular pachinko machines in Japanese arcades. It was a battle between you and the computer which increasingly got harder and harder and harder and just never let up. One of the most interesting things about the game is the way that it actually gets faster. Space Invaders was the first Japanese game to be made with microprocessors. And it's actually a result of the hardware in that as the aliens get destroyed, it frees up processing power so the aliens move faster because it, the computer can process them more quickly. But it actually results in this beautiful gameplay flow. Space Invaders sold an unprecedented 100,000 units in the first year and more in the following years. Moving into the home, the game had a great influence on the increased sales of the Atari 2600 console. This was at a point too where there was this real focus on, on trying to recreate the arcade experience in the home because it was expensive to go to the arcades and people started to hope that maybe with consoles like the Atari 2600 you might be able to replicate that experience in your own environment. In the early 80s, concern was rising over the influence Space Invaders and other games was having on the young minds of its players. Now that it was available in the home, players were free to play for as long as they liked. Despite opposition, Space Invaders retained its popularity into the 21st century, its cultural impact earning it a place in the Museum of Modern Art.
video games and video game cultures were incredibly important to the 20th century. I think that, you know, they were the first creative medium, the first art form of digital technology. When the computer arrived, video games arrived with them almost from the beginning, and I think it's impossible to underestimate how significant that was, both for culture, for leisure culture, popular culture, but also for society and technological advancements more broadly. As America's involvement in the Vietnam War drew to an end, President Richard Nixon turned his attention to a new war, one that would be fought on the streets of American cities. America's drug problem. It's simply too complex and too deep-rooted. The raid was just one of hundreds made every year all over America in an effort to curb one of the nation's most rapidly growing social problems, drug addiction. An insidious conflict was taking hold in the United States. Societal pressures, including the ongoing war, the draft and unemployment, rested heavily on the shoulders of the confused youth, who turned to substance abuse to dull their senses. Drug use had been rising in the 60s, with the growth of a youth drug culture and experimentation of conscious expansion. Instead of focusing on the problems facing America's youth, Nixon targeted the victims of drug abuse, setting society against them. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. The notion that drug culture was rife on the campuses, that drug culture was destroying the ghettos, was commonplace in the minds of the white establishment in the early 1970s. So Nixon makes war on drugs part of his drive for law and order. Nixon increased federal funding to drug control agencies, brought in mandatory sentencing, and created a new department, the Drug Enforcement Administration. The new department's budgets more than doubled over the years. Future presidents would also take up arms against narcotics. The Reagan husband and wife team tackled the problem from two sides. Ronald focused on law enforcement while Nancy campaigned to the young. I was asked by a group of children what to do if they were offered drugs. And I answered, just say no. Well, Reagan took the approach to lock up the drug traffickers was the only solution to the problem. Now that meant that uh, you had a lot of black youth who were dealing as the only way to make a tolerable living in the inner cities which were, had now seen massive loss of jobs, of industry, since the 1960s. And what happened with this lock em up strategy was that you had the mass incarceration of African-American youth. Politicians on both sides know that there's no single answer to America's drug problem. It's simply too complex and too deep-rooted. Following administrations would take a similarly negative view of the drug problem. All of this stemmed from a policy aimed at keeping Nixon in the White House. Its negative ramifications extended more than 30 years in the future, stigmatizing drug use. While it is debatable whether drug use was a large-scale problem in mid-century America, it is sure that the administration's harsh response to the situation has created more harm than good. A family tragedy in Outback Australia will capture the attention of the world, creating a media frenzy whose greatest casualty would be a grieving mother. On the 17th of August 1980, Lindy and Michael Chamberlain and their three children were camping at the ancient monolith Uluru in the central Australian desert. The Chamberlains put their children, Aidan, Regan, and nine-week-old Azaria to bed and joined other campers. Many of these would later report seeing dingoes, Australia's native wild dog nearby. A baby's cry had Lindy running to the family tent. There wasn't time to go and tell people. I just yelled out, has anyone got a torch? Dingoes got my baby. 
A frantic search by campers and local indigenous trackers could not find the baby. A week later, her tiny jumpsuit was recovered, showing incisions around the neck. The matinee jacket she had been wearing was gone. In the Uluru area, it was well known that dingoes were starting to come too close to campers. So in the immediate aftermath of Azaria's being taken, the view in the local vicinity was that she had been taken by a dingo. Sympathy soon turned to suspicion. Police discounted Lindy's account, claiming a wild dog could not carry a baby in its mouth. Six months after Azaria's disappearance, an inquest ruled the likely cause was a dingo attack. I further find that neither the parents of the child nor either of their remaining children were in any degree whatsoever responsible for this death. Yet police disputed the finding. Key evidence were the incision marks on the jumpsuit and a contentious forensic report of bloodstains in the car. And that evidence sparked a second coronial inquest. And there was a very adversarial approach that was taken by the Northern Territory government at that second coronial inquest. When that coronial inquest closed, the coroner recommended that the Chamberlains be charged with murder. Lindy was convicted of murder on the 29th of October, 1982. She was sentenced to life imprisonment. Michael was found guilty as an accessory and given an 18 month suspended sentence. The Chamberlain's trial wasn't just taking place in a law court. Their personal tragedy and how they responded was being dissected around the country and around the world. I think it's probably fair to say that the Chamberlains were um, unusual characters in the public imagination and there was suspicion about whether grieving parents would behave in the way that they behaved. Of course, today we understand that there are all different ways to grieve the loss of a child and that the way one performs in public might be quite different to the way one feels in private. In early 1986, three years into Lindy's life sentence, an English tourist died from a fall on Uluru. As police searched the area, they discovered a small item of clothing in a dingo lair. It was identified as Azaria's missing matinee jacket. Lindy was immediately released and the case reopened. The real fight for justice is only just starting. You might think it's nearly finished, but believe me, it's only just beginning. Two years later, all convictions against the Chamberlains were overturned. A third inquest in 1995 ruled the cause of Azaria's death was unknown. And it was only the final inquest in 2012 that found a dingo responsible for her death. So that is now the legal position and the Chamberlain's convictions have been quashed. The cause of her death was as the result of being attacked and taken by a dingo. As a result of the case, more rigorous forensic standards were introduced in Australia. In the early days of World War II, with Europe falling before German forces, close to 400,000 British and Allied troops were surrounded and trapped in northern France. With the outcome of the war hanging in the balance, Britain needed a miracle. Germany's blitzkrieg tactics, the lightning war, saw Poland, Holland, Denmark and Luxembourg fall quickly. The shadow of the conquering German armies covered Western Europe. The self-styled master race was riding high. Hitler and his generals turned their attention towards invading Belgium and France. German tanks and troops stormed through, pushing Allied forces back to the coastline in May 1940 to the town called Dunkirk. The British and French forces were very much taken by surprise. It was a, a, a blitzkrieg that led to German forces getting to the coast incredibly quickly. And that meant that effectively the British and French armies were effectively cut in two, with the best of those armies in Belgium completely encircled. Uh, and they had only one option, either to break out to the south or to the head to the coast and try and evacuate there. Winston Churchill, newly appointed as Britain's Prime Minister, ordered the Royal Navy to evacuate Allied soldiers in Operation Dynamo. On the first day, around 200,000 soldiers waited their turn to move onto the Dunkirk Mole. 
a long stone and wooden jetty on the edge of the port. Naval ships would not enter the shallow waters, so help was needed to ferry the men from the beach. A call was sent out across Britain for as many vessels as possible to assist, including small craft that could get close to the waiting soldiers in the shallow waters. Every kind of small craft, destroyers, paddle steamers, yachts, motorboats, rainboats, have sped here to the burning ruins of Dunkirk to bring off the gallant British and French troops. There's a bit of a myth that everyone was taken off by these little ships because the majority were taken off by the moles by the Royal Navy. But these little ships undoubtedly had an effect. From the 26th of May to the 4th of June, over 900 Royal Navy ships and civilian vessels evacuated more than 330,000 stranded troops, far above what military authorities have believed possible. 700 civilian boats made multiple trips to fetch more troops from the beach, often with enemy bombs raining down on them. Despite evacuating more than 330,000 personnel, including Polish, French and Belgian nationals, around 68,000 British troops were captured or killed. The largest military evacuation in history, the Dunkirk spirit came to represent British endurance in the face of adversity. There was a wonderful propaganda uh, benefit from saying, look, you know, the Germans had our troops trapped. Really, there was no chance of them to escape, and yet we got them away. We, we literally snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. But there was a much more practical significance, and that is that the professional uh, British army, which was effectively at Dunkirk, we got back to the UK. And without their professionalism and without their know-how, the British Army thereafter for the rest of the Second World War wouldn't have been anything like as effective. In 1979, an enigmatic figure rose to world prominence, leading a religious revolution in Iran to depose the secular Shah, a revolution which would change the course of a country's history. Iran had experienced ruling tensions since the 1940s. The British-backed Shah saw himself as a successor to the great Persian kings of the ancient world, living a glamorous and extravagant life. The Shah's reign became increasingly at odds with the population, his lavish lifestyle provoking protests that economic reforms only benefited the elite, while attempts to westernize Iranian culture angered conservative religious leaders. If you go to Iran and you see how the royal family had lived <laughs> before the revolution, you can kind of understand why there was a lot of anger and why there was support from some people for that in the first place, because, you know, there was a tremendous amount of corruption, of wealth. A vocal critic was the exiled Shiite cleric Ayatollah Khomeini, who broadcast to his supporters from France. As the Shah's regime became increasingly repressive, riots in 1978 developed into a state of virtual civil war. Thousands took to the streets in Tehran, destroying symbols of westernization like banks and liquor stores. In December, soldiers mutinied, attacking the Shah's security officers. With his regime in ruins and Khomeini calling for his arrest, the Shah fled in January 1979. I'm terribly delighted. This is something that Iranians have been waiting for many, many years. So very happy that Shah in Iran. Shah in Iran. Khomeini returned to Iran, and his revolutionary forces seized control of the country, creating an Islamic republic. It had an enormous impact on Iran because he transformed the Iranian revolution from an anti-Shah revolution into an Islamic revolution and established uh, an Islamic system of governance. Religious clergy swiftly excluded their former left-wing and intellectual allies from power, returning the country to enforced conservative social values. Ayatollah Khomeini had changed Iran from a place which had been fairly cosmopolitan to a place where you know, women had to cover themselves and if they didn't do that, then the morality police would come and arrest them. 
Anti-Western feeling continued to grow, erupting when the Shah was given shelter in the US for cancer treatment. Thousands protested in the streets each day, demanding his return to face trial for his crimes. Khomeini was declared ruler for life at the end of 1979 and called for his revolution to spread throughout the Persian Gulf in a single unified state. This is really the first time that a leader comes to power and declares a political Islam, and for that matter, a Shia version, as the ideology of the state. The Americans really saw that as nothing more than fundamentalism. Tensions with the West escalated. I think his revolution had an unfortunate effect on the way the West sees Islam, because, you know, we, what we saw of the revolution and the repression gives a very bad impression of what Islam is to a lot of people who don't understand it and haven't read the Quran themselves. Iran's 1979 revolution had lasting effect, with increased tensions between Sunni and Shia Muslims and anti-Western sentiment growing ever stronger in the Middle East. With the invention of the radio, scientists were keen to see what else they could do with this new technology, and by pure accident, found a use that would change the way we cooked. The microwave was born because self-taught scientist Percy Spencer had a habit of carrying food in his pocket. Percy had done marvellous work increasing magnetron production during the war, and his team were eager to discover further uses for the machine. And it's technologically a very interesting gadget, but basically it's a magnet which bends electrons so you can shape their path, and if you get them to bounce around, you can make waves. The magnetron is used as the microwave generator. It was while Percy was testing the magnetron machine that he realised it had an effect on him the peanut cluster bar in his pocket had melted. So he thought, hmm, that's interesting. So they began to play with putting foodstuffs near the magnetron, and interesting things happened. And they realized that actually, if you got a box and put a magnetron outside it, you could cook things, microwave oven. Percy and his team took out a patent on October the 8th, 1945. In 1947, the Raytheon team created the first microwave called the radar range. And here's the real breakthrough. The oven uses radio waves at the frequencies used in radar. This reheats the meal in an incredibly short time. And if you decided to buy a radar range, you'd have to have a bit of space in your kitchen. It weighed about 750 pounds, and it cost a lot. It wasn't really till the 1960s, about 1967, that the kind of box that we would now recognize began to appear. And it took the uh, domestic world by storm. This was a new gadget, so lots of enthusiasm for that. The convenience of frozen food began to take off in home cooking with the arrival of the much smaller countertop model in 1967 at a more manageable price of $495. A new age of TV dinners and easy cooking was dawning. What we began to find was that you could invent prepackaged meals that you could simply heat up which meant people could live busier lives, less time spent in the kitchen cooking. To some extent, um, made the cooking uh, less of a, a gender-specific task. It wasn't the housewife in the kitchen anymore. Anyone can slick a ready-made meal in the microwave, push a few buttons, and off you go. The appliance became known as the microwave for the short-form waves used in cooking. As the appliance gained popularity, it became an everyday household appliance for many homes throughout the world. But I'd have to say, for me, as someone who looks at innovation, it's a classic example of an accident. But an accident that uh, isn't just, oh, that's funny, but an accident that you then work on to see where it takes you. There were more than two sides to the Cold War. While the first and second world countries were antagonizing each other, a large group of the remaining nations chose not to align themselves in the fray, but to focus optimistically on building a new world. In 
In the wake of the Second World War, countries formed new leaderships, new alliances, and new enemies. Relationships between America and the Soviet Union had disintegrated in the years since the Yalta Conference of 1945, where they had planned to cooperate in creating a new world. In April 1955, the Third World came together at the Bandung Conference in Indonesia to discuss issues that concerned them all. The idea of the Bandung Conference was that this was part of the idea of the Third World, that uh, there should be a bloc that was outside of what the USSR, the communist sphere and the USA were doing. Attendance was made up of 29 countries from Asia, the Middle East and Africa. The aims of the conference were quite complicated because the big agenda was independence. So they were campaigning for things like Algerian independence and the Palestinian cause. South Africa was also a big part of the agenda. There was another emphasis during this conference, and that was the end of the old order of colonization. Many countries were gaining their independence and pushing for others to join them. In the Royal Palace at Amsterdam, the transfer of sovereignty creating a new independent republic, the United States of Indonesia, has been completed. Colonization was expressly denounced as the developing third world sought to pull itself out from under old regimes. Deciding the guest list to the conference was a contentious issue in itself. Nothing could be decided in Asia without China, but the other nations were unsure of the stance China would take as a communist country when it arrived at the conference. The United States were tying itself up in strategic knots over the role communism would play in the conference. What the US wanted to do was basically to know what was going on. They were suspicious, so the US was really focused on what's China up to, how are we going to manoeuvre in terms of the new situation that's developing. Ultimately, they needn't have worried. China didn't push its own agenda, instead promoting unity and cooperation. The 1955 conference was a triumph for the five sponsoring nations, Burma, Indonesia, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and particularly India. But within a few decades, the spirit of Bandung had waned and efforts to repeat the event has met with limited success in the 21st century. The Bandung Conference was unique for the scope of its agenda. It was set a strong direction for world politics in the years to follow. Bandung is seen as the starting point for the non-aligned movement, but in some ways it's the end point of a particular kind of international socialist agenda and that it's the point at which a number of different countries split off and go their own way. The legacy is the idea that you can have a separate agenda, that you don't just have to follow the Cold War polarisation of USSR versus the West, that, that there were other ways to advance the cause of developing countries. Politics and sex have been bedfellows throughout history. But at the end of the 20th century, a scandal threatened one of the most powerful figures in the world, the President of the United States. In fact, it was wrong. Bill Clinton was elected the 42nd President of the United States in 1993 at the age of 46 the first president from the baby boomers generation. He had a high public approval rating from the beginning of his official term. Clinton's first term is very, very difficult to characterize. Uh, it's neither a success nor a failure. But what is happening at the same time is that the economy is recovering from the 1991 recession very nicely. That is largely due to the low interest policies of the Federal Reserve. But because Clinton is president, he can claim credit for a recovering economy. And he goes into the 1996 election as the president of prosperity. We're in the midst of the longest economic expansion in history. More than 22 million new jobs, the lowest unemployment in 30 years, the lowest female unemployment in 40 years. 
Yet Clinton's legacy would be forever linked with sex scandals from his time in office. In 1995, President Clinton began an affair with 22-year-old White House intern Monica Lewinsky. By 1998, details of the Lewinsky affair were being reported in the media. Clinton, standing beside his wife at the White House, gave a press conference denying the allegations. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Despite the denial, the rumors refused to die down. But Lewinsky remained silent. Speculation began to occur on whether Clinton would be impeached. A standing US official could be formally charged with treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors under Article 2 of the United States Constitution. Clinton, by any standards, behaved very, very foolishly uh, and uh, very badly for a president, sullied the office. Without doubt, he lied. But whether the, these were grounds for impeachment you... is highly questionable. In July 1998, Lewinsky was given total witness immunity in exchange for grand jury testimony about her relationship with Clinton. The most damning evidence was a stained dress. The president publicly admitted the affair a few weeks later. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. In fact, it was wrong. For her part, Lewinsky was vilified. The scandal would cling to her, forcing her from public life for more than a decade. Clinton was now forced to face impeachment proceedings, the first in 130 years. It was based on two charges, one of perjury and one of obstruction of justice in connection with the sexual affair. The White House chose to deal with the issue by going about business as usual. Clinton in um, early 1998 delivered a State of the Union address shortly after the Lewinsky scandal has become public knowledge. And in it, he glorifies the economy, which is now going into overdrive in terms of prosperity, job creation, and low inflation. It was very fortunate uh, for Clinton that Americans decided that his foibles were personal ones rather than public ones, and that uh, Clinton deserved kudos for the economy. On the 12th of February, 1999, the country heard the House's ruling. The motion had failed. Clinton was acquitted and remained in office, serving to the end of his second term in 2001. He left office with the highest approval rating of any US president since the Second World War. In the early years of the 20th century, the terrible effects of alcoholism on American society fueled the rise of a temperance movement one that became so powerful it would influence government policy and usher in an era defined by its flappers, gangsters and speakeasies. With an amendment to the Constitution, Article 18 forbade the manufacturing, selling and transporting of intoxicating beverages. Well, when Prohibition came in, after the First World War, really there'd been a hundred years at least of concern about America's drinking problem. And uh, Americans drank very heavily and they tended to drink very high rates of alcoholic concentrations. Vintners and brewers were forced to close their doors as the nation's fifth largest industry was shut overnight. What it didn't do was outlaw the actual drinking. So it was quite carefully drafted to avoid criminalising the act of drinking. What that led to was it was perfectly legal for people to, if they had the money, to buy a cellar full of wine or drink or bourbon before Prohibition came in and, and just drink it out. And that, of course, was done. But alcohol didn't disappear. It just went underground. Bootleggers became the greatest beneficiaries of the ban as a sea of alcohol was smuggled into and sold in speakeasies around the country. Coordinating the bootlegging produced one of the era's most enduring legacies. Public enemy number one, they don't come any bigger than Alphonse Capone. In the hands of Al Capone, Maya Lewinsky and Lucky Luciano, 
Organised crime reached new and frightening heights. Newspapers and movies carried stories of gang warfare and violent crimes. And while the gangs tightened their strongholds, law enforcement rose up to fight them. Meanwhile, in the underground and hidden speakeasies, a social revolution was happening. Here, independent young women, many freed from traditional domestic employment, twirled in their flapper dresses and flirted with dashing men while sipping cocktails. But while corruption was rife and criminals made millions, it was the onslaught of the Great Depression that eventually brought down prohibition. It was always never utterly popular and in its enforcement it became more unpopular. It did have the effect of criminalising middle class people, often young people who simply wanted to have a drink and who got caught up in police raids and nets. And then, of course, when the Great Depression came, the loss of alcohol-based taxation revenue and excises uh, became an even stronger argument. When Franklin D. Roosevelt was sworn into office in 1933, he introduced a series of economic reforms, which included the repeal of Article 18. And in 1933, the alcohol ban was finally lifted. As the years told on, it became obvious that prohibition had to go. America's joy was unbridled as it fought its way into the wide open saloons and bars across the country. It was open house for a parched nation. Prohibition had been repealed and almost nobody was sorry.